that's been communicating with man throughout history and various methods akin to, as you put it, an artistic expression, a type of inspirational performance art, which is a way I've never really thought about it or heard it explained, although, like a lot of people, I tend to address most paranormal phenomenon and UFO sightings as pieces of the same puzzle, but can you elaborate on the artistic expression concept a bit for the people? Sure. It was, I mean, it probably, <clears throat> excuse me, it probably stems from my own background as an artist, both as a musician and a filmmaker, so I sort of have that way of looking at the world. But over the last 10 or 12 years, making films and, and doing the television series Ghost Cases, having some of my own experiences, and meeting an awful lot of people and listening to the, their stories about their experiences, um, I tried to figure out, at least to my own satisfaction, what does this look like to me? Because with UFOs, of course, the predominant meme throughout the last 50 or 60 years has been, if you believe there's a paranormal aspect to it, you know, aliens from outer space. Mm -hmm. There's sort of a subset that comes from the Jacques Vallée school, if you will, that talks about extra dimensionals or, or things like that. But generally speaking, that's how they look at it. And the if you go on to message forums or chat rooms or, or listen to uh, Internet radio or regular radio, you know, what you're usually going to hear is people arguing in many cases and in some case, more informed cases discussing politely where these advanced non-human intelligences are from. That's the big debate. I have no idea. And I don't think any of us can have any idea. And I, I sort of, after years of talking to people, kind of found it one of the most unproductive and useless conversations that you could ever have in your entire life. Kind of akin to arguing over you know, who's better, the Red Sox or the Yankees? Just sort of a waste of time because right. we don't know. So what I wanted to do was try and what I thought would be more productive is to say, look, I can't tell you where they're from. I'm just going to make an assumption for the sake of argument that they exist. The question really should be, what are they trying to communicate, if anything, to us? What is the purpose? Can we divine a purpose behind the paranormal, if you will? Mm -hmm. So I looked at it. From that angle, not trying to figure out where they're from, but trying to figure out what they might want or what they might be trying to communicate to us. And through a series of conversations over a number of years with friends like Nick Redfern and Greg Bishop and the late Mac, late Mac Tonys, I, especially Greg, Greg and I would talk a lot about communication and the problems that arise just within humanity. In terms of communication, right. if you were Albanian and I was Peruvian, so you would be speaking Albanian, I would presumably be speaking Spanish. If we didn't know each other's language, we'd have a very hard time communicating in any meaningful way using verbal communication. Mm -hmm. So humans are constrained very much by our culture, by the things that sort of we've grown up with, but also by our language in terms of trying to communicate. The one thing that allows us to transcend those barriers that we've sort of imposed upon ourselves over the centuries is art. So artistic expression, whether it's music, whether it's painting, whether it's dance, you know, I could run, run down the list, is a way of communicating, very much communicating, that doesn't require language. So it's the most fun, to me, it's the most fundamental form of communication. I, I produced, I don't just do uh, paranormal stuff, folks. <laughs> I produced and hosted uh, a series here in Canada for Bravo uh, about a decade ago called The Classical Now, two, two, 26 episodes, two seasons, of Canada's top young classical musicians performing and then talking about their their work. Mm -hmm. And they would repeatedly, whenever you would ask them, you know, what was their music about when they were performing something by Mozart or Bach or Rimsky-Korsakov or whomever, um, they would talk about colors in the music. They would talk about communication. They would talk about feelings which again, to me, is the most basic form of communication you can have. Not necessarily us trying to filter things into words, but just feelings and impressions and things that, frankly, are, are go far beyond the kind of very linear, if you will, form of communication that we have in terms of verbal communication. So fine. I said, great. This, to me, is what the paranormal looks like. If you are dealing with an advanced non-human intelligence, it's highly unlikely, at least in my mind, that they would be trying to speak to us any more than we would be trying to speak to uh, a two-year-old infant and have that infant understand us. Or I, I hesitate to use the sort of example of dogs or ants or, or whatever. I'll right. stick with humans. So 
what you would do with that infant, though, how you can communicate with them. And you, know, you can hear people talk about playing Mozart to babies in the womb, even trying to instill upon them some sort of level of, of culture or higher intelligence, which is what I think Mozart is. You can communicate using nonverbal verbal forms of communication. So music, art, painting. When I look at the paranormal, that's what I see. I see an attempt at communication using what we, if we really look at it, would call different artistic forms. So take UFOs, for instance. Mm -hmm. Please take them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm here twice on Sundays, folks. The, uh, you see light, you hear reports of lights in the sky. You can look, when I did best evidence, top 10 UFO sightings, I can't remember, well, I'm trying to think of all the cases, but take the, uh, Mals, the Malmstrom missile base case, the top case, the RB-47 case, yes. and, think, and the list of cases. Almost all, all of those cases involved sightings of what you could call lights in the sky mm -hmm. in very varying, varying different forms. The Rendlesham case, the, the reports of, of lights dancing above the base in the United Kingdom and sending what they described as lasers or laser-like lights down. But those are basically light displays. We have those same kinds of, we do those same kinds of things. Go to any baseball game on the 4th of July, actually any minor league game in California, you'll see a fireworks display after the game. If you exactly. go to, if you go to the Czech Republic, uh, and I have, I talk about this briefly in the book, you can go to Prague and see black light theater. You can go to Burning Man in the United States and see all sorts of light displays. And you can appreciate them even more if you indulge in some of the potentially illegal substances that True. you find at Burning Man. So you've got all these things going on. And to me, that's it, it, it appears as an artistic presentation. And the interesting thing is, well, I, I was talking to somebody and they said, well, wait a second now. Art. Um, it doesn't make any sense, though. What, what's the message? I said, well, first of all, a lot of good art doesn't make any sense. It's open to multiple interpretations. The, the purpose of, that an artist, having been one, you, you don't. The one thing they'll teach you when you're writing film scripts, for instance, is the, the worst criticism you can get from somebody who reads your script is it's too on the nose, which is to say it's it literally is hammering the audience. It's it's giving the message away from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So what people want are film scripts that are not quite so literal. So even within, you know, film, you don't want to literally tell the audience and give them the answer right away. It's what makes M. Night Shyamalan's The Sixth Sense such a, a compelling movie is, you know, the answer when you isn't obvious until the end, and then you go back and you can see how it all should have been obvious, but the cleverness of the filmmaker kind of took you with the story. You know, look at a Jackson, you, the three of us could walk into an art gallery, stand in front of a Jackson Pollock painting or a, a Dolly or a Picasso and look at it and say, and all three of us could take a different meaning out of it. And if you added the artist into the mix, what was he originally thinking when he painted it? There's four different interpretations. So in many respects, we become a, a co even a co-creator of the artistic interpretation. You know, I can go down different people when they listen to Bach or when they listen to the Beatles will take different things out of those songs so or or that music. So I don't think the purpose is to give us a particular message. I think the purpose is to encourage us to think. Um, I hate the phrase outside the box, but I'm going to use it. To think outside the box, to imagine different possibilities, to to look inside the box too, if you will, to look inside ourselves. So all of those things, that to me is what the paranormal is doing. You can find that you can find those kinds of things throughout human history too. So it's not confined to the UFO era of 1947 onwards, the sort of modern UFO era. You can find all these, you can find all of these kinds of things throughout human history. So I think it's something that's been interacting with us from the very beginning. I think it has a lot to do with human consciousness with an understanding of ourselves, which is why one of the uh, subtitles of the book, I think it's the paranormal, the art of the imagination and the human condition. So I talk a lot in the book about us too, mm -hmm. about where we've been, where we are and where we're going. And um, I think the paranormal has a, a part to play in that. Well, you mentioned briefly a, a better appreciation for a light show on certain chemical compounds, psychedelics and I think that there, me and Jake were talking about psychedelics a bit in the pre-show, but I think there's a real link between artists and psychedelics. It's pretty obvious for a lot of people, but you hear 
someone talk about the late great Terrence McKenna describing his communication with the greater intelligence through mushrooms and DMT, and he describes the manifestations of dancing machine elves that approach him holding out various complex geometric shapes. And what is that other than performance art, you know? I mean, there's a brief mention of ayahuasca in your book, but I'm kind of curious, have you had any experience with using psychedelics as a tool for communicating with this intelligence at all? No comment. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I wish. Actually, when we were doing ghost cases, my uh, co-host, Holly Stevens, and I used to joke on a regular basis that when it was all over, we should have some sort of spiritual cleansing kind of ceremony. Because at the, mm -hmm. you know, we were joking that maybe these dark forces, and I, as it, I make clear in the book, I don't think, um, and we can talk about this maybe if you want, uh, the reason why I don't think they're evil or dark or anything like that, but that I didn't necessarily think that at the time in 2009 when we were shooting the series and I was being strangled in jail cells or whatever. So, you know, we thought, what if these things, what if this, whatever these are, attach themselves to us? So we talked to a few people and they said, look, you can get a spiritual cleansing. I said, well, we could go see a Roman Catholic priest or an Anglican priest or whatever, but wouldn't it be much more fun if we went down to Peru? Yeah, I traveled up, you know, the one of the rivers to one of the sort of aboriginal settlements and just did one of those ayahuasca retreats and kind of, you know, it's a sort of I've talked to people, I've met people who've done those things and they go in one way and they come out entire in an entirely different way. I've never met anyone who's done something like that who hasn't been changed. Yeah, um, I agree. And always in a positive. I've never seen anyone, you know, you see people who, who become cocaine or meth addicts or something, and it changes their lives in a very negative way. They become addicted. This is, I've never heard of that happening with people who've had this experience with ayahuasca or any of the, you know, like peyote in the, uh, in the Southwestern United States or any of the, whatever different substance you're using in whatever different culture. Um, it's always been a very positive eye-opening experience. I mean, in the worst case scenario, you kind of get sick and you don't take to it. Mm -hmm. which um, I actually checked with my doctor. He said, look, <laughs> you know, you, if you do do this, um, here's here's a few things that could happen to you. You're not going to die, but it might not be a pleasant physical experience for you. But um, that's sort of the risk you take. So, yeah, you know, it's something I'd like to do, but it's not something that I've ever done. Uh, right. we, for one reason or another, we decided not to do it. We wound up going to the Czech Republic instead. And so that made a very interesting chapter in my book eventually because I ran into shadow people and the Chesky Krumlov. Yeah. So I was, I, I probably would have wound up writing about meeting machine elves on <laughs> ayahuasca or shadow people in Czech Republic, but one way or another, you know, I, I sort of had a paranormal experience, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's weird because it's psychedelics seem to make that communication easier. It seems to be able, you are able to access the, the other a little bit simpler it's it's weird but i mean your book does cover a lot of ground and i really enjoy the parts about your experiences filming ghost cases i've always sort of found ghosts to be the most cheesy of paranormal topics and i'm because i'm i'm kind of turned off by the religious implications and and all that but you did have a few interesting things happen there can you share a couple of those stories sure i you know i've never prior to doing ghost cases i had never watched a single episode of any of the ghost hunting shows, including Ghost Hunters. I think I'd watch five minutes once, which was six minutes too much. So, you know, it was not a genre that I was particularly interested in, and ghosts, uh, not, not something that I was particularly interested in, even within the paranormal. Even though the maritime provinces of Canada have a, a very rich history, much like New England does. I mean, every region of the world has a rich history of ghosts and legends, but the East Coast, New England, the Maritimes, stemming back into Aboriginal culture and their legends, very rich sort of history of ghosts and paranormal happenings. So I, it, I was familiar with it. It just wasn't something I'd spent a lot of time thinking about. So I went in, you know, it was a gig, frankly. Uh, and that's what I do for a living. I'm a filmmaker, so I'll take a gig. And it just so happened it sounded interesting and it was something to do with the paranormal. So that was interesting, too. And of all the things I've done, in my career related to the paranormal, it's it definitely proved to be the most interesting thing that I'd ever done, simply because I wasn't meant to host it. I was originally just going to direct it, produce it, and write it. But we wound up, I won't say firing, we had a mutual parting of ways with the original hosts who were, quote, quote, professional ghost hunters. And they were very sincere people, very nice people, and they took themselves, they took themselves and what they did very seriously, which just didn't fit in with what we were doing. 
they didn't understand the constraints of a half an hour television program. So there's, you know, there's certain things you can't sit in a library. You can't broadcast somebody sitting in a library trying to communicate in quotation marks with a ghost for eight hours. It just doesn't translate to TV very well. Yeah. So, so they left by mutual agreement and then we needed a host. So I was it. I wound up hosting as well as all those other things. And I brought Holly in cause I needed a co-host um, because you know, she's much better looking than I am. <laughs> and she also had a science degree and we thought that would be a useful thing. She was a good friend. Um, in terms of some, so yeah, it was fun. In terms of some of the cases, one of the ones I describe in the book, I'm trying to think of the ones that I, I haven't talked about quite so much because there's there's one or two that I almost always talk about. The one I liked the most was, and it was kind of brief, but your description of this black void that you and uh, Dave Sadler had saw. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, it was Dave um, uh, Dale Stevens, my co-producer, uh, but it was at a church in Shocklack, England. It's probably my favorite case yeah uh, very it is weird the one, it is the one i talk about the most i think because it is my favorite primarily because it was a really cool place a very old church from the 13th century in england um dave sadler is part of an organization called the upia which is a sort of very uh, good paranormal investigating group of people in the united kingdom in the cheshire region and he was a, an old friend of mine. So he agreed to help us out. We did four episodes there. One of them was in Shocklack. He had visited there a number of times with a number of different people. Every time he'd been there, something weird had happened. So, And other people who had visited had also, you know, had a very long history of weird things going on. It's also very important to understand it's a very isolated place. Shocklack, I think the population is eight cows, four sheep. And if you drive down three miles, there's um, there's a guy who lives in a house. That's about <laughs> That's, it. That sounds like a sexy fun time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's on the Welsh border. There is a town, you know, within driving distance, but it's you couldn't, you know, it's a drive. So it's pretty isolated. When we got there, Dave walked us through. You know, this is Dave Sadler walked us through the location, gave us a bit of the history, and then you know, we all set about doing what we do, which is we split up, kind of did different things. At one point, and night fell, and I found myself sitting. The camera crew was, I think it was, the camera crew was off with Holly, that's right, and another investigator named Steve Mara. Dave Sadler was um, somewhere else in the church grounds far away, and um, my co-producer, Dale Stevens, was somewhere else, I think, out by the van. So there I was. I was, I was just sitting at the back of the church, kind of waiting for the crew to finish up with Holly, and then I was, you know, plotting out what the next segment that I would do or whatever. And I looked out of the sort of corner of my eye over at the tree line um, past the cemetery. And there's no such thing as a purely black sky. At least I've never seen one. There's always mm. some sort of ambient light from the moon or something like that. And so the sky, you know, maybe was I don't know, 85% black, we'll say. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the sky, uh, not it didn't fly into the sky. It didn't come from one side to another. It just appeared. I describe it as a black void almost um there's an old episode of star trek where this girl keeps sort of warping in and out she um she opens up a trans-dimensional doorway or something and comes in and kills members of the the enterprise crew and so i frame everything in terms of star wars and star trek that's where i that's where i yeah. come from but yeah it was like this this void in the sky sort of appeared and it lasted for a couple seconds and then boom it just disappeared and i was i was still back then not inclined to talk about those things i was frankly embarrassed when something would happen you know i've i have a law degree uh, i'm a professional so what my uncle stan friedman is often talked about is the laughter curtain i wasn't afraid of the laughter curtain but there was still that part of me that that said hey i can't believe that whatever just happened just happened and b even though i'm here hosting a sort of ghost investigating television series i don't want to look like an idiot i don't particularly want to talk about this i'm supposed to be skeptical Right. So I wouldn't have said anything, except Dale Stevens, my co-producer, wandered over, I don't know, five or ten minutes later, and he said, you'll never believe what I, I saw a few minutes ago over there. And he pointed at a completely different part of the church um, cemetery yard. It was a rather large, I mean, it's a large cemetery yard. Mm -hmm. Off the top of my head, maybe the size of a football field and a half. And that's a Canadian football field, which is bigger than your football fields. <laughs> and he, descri he described what I saw only in sli slightly different way, but it was definitely the sort of black void in the sky. He used some different terminology than I did. He framed it in something other than Star Trek language. He used something else. And I said, wow, 
He said, yeah, I know. That's crazy, isn't it? And I went, well, it might not be quite so crazy, Dale. <laughs> and then I told him what I had seen. And he immediately yelled at the camera crew to stop talking to Holly and, um, and come over and interview me while I was still, you know, at this point, I was kind of ramping up into being willing to talk about it. So in the television episode series in the episode, which I actually have online at my company's website, so people can see this kind of, you know, without having to pay for it, you, um, you don't see the black void in the sky. All we could do was sort of a, a lame reproduction of an animated reproduction of it because we didn't catch it on camera. But you can see me. I'm a reasonably sensible guy. I try to maintain a, a level keel. I've been in some tight spots before, you know, had yeah. some had some strange things. I was a, briefly an RCMP officer when I was in law school. I've, I've had some I've been in tight spots, but I was running on nervous energy this night. And it comes through in the episode because what I had seen really was pretty amazing not in a scary way just wow i can't believe that happened and um and then there were other things that happened that night too that wasn't the only thing there were audio anomalies holly and i both heard the sound of horses hooves and there's sort of a long story associated with that but it, mm -hmm. it was a recurring theme that a lot of people had heard there's nothing around there there's no cobblestone path or anything i live in a city with cobblestone streets i've heard horses hooves on cobblestone i know what it sounds like that's what i heard there was nothing there that when we looked all around, there was nothing there that could have made those sounds. The weird. weird thing is we we heard them multiple times. Holly heard them once by herself, I heard them once by myself, and then we heard them together as we were talking about why I hadn't told her about hearing them in the first place. Again, not wanting to um to talk about those things. And then as we're talking and as she's chewing me out off camera, because the camera crew had wandered off to do something else with Dave Sadler, we both looked at each other and went, Did you hear that? Yes, that clip clock clip, yes. You know, kind of that mute, and we were like, wow. So we yelled at the camera crew to come back over. And of course, by the time they got there, there was nothing to pick up. We had audio recorders. They didn't pick up anything. So even though we both heard it, there's nothing on either of our audio recorders that we were carrying. So when I look at that entire night, going back to the artistic thing, to me, that it's like going to a Cirque du Soleil show in Vegas and mm -hmm, see Steer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a series of strange, weird, wonderful, mind-boggling things that are happening to you. And there were some other things. Steve Marev saw some light anomalies that we couldn't explain. And it was just a night of sort of a, a cavalcade of weirdness that kept going, battery drains and all sorts of strange stuff. None of which we captured on camera, none of which we captured on any measurable thing like audio recorders and at other locations and other, other times we did catch sort of strange things on camera and audio recordings. But here, Everything was very personal. It was just out of reach of whatever it was that we were using to record it. Um, that's that's kind of a cross between a comedy club and, you know, Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> very much performance art kind of thing. And we all walked away. And this is why I say when the, um, the purpose of all this is to make us think, to imagine, to wonder, all that sort of stuff, to talk amongst ourselves about the possibilities of what might be out there. That if that is what they quotation marks they are trying to do, mission accomplished on that night in Shocklack. Because when we were heading back to the hotel, which was we we're staying in a town called Congleton, which I don't know, is about two hours away, two hour drive away. I, you know, all we could do in the van, Holly and I were in one van. There were two two vans in the van we were in. I think it was me, Holly, Dave Sadler, and one other fellow. All we could do was talk about what we had experienced and and what it might mean so you know and that led to a broader conversation about things like um who we are and all that other sort of stuff so yeah they're not in that case they wouldn't be giving us the answers they're just opening the door providing us with questions and then letting us try and come up with our own answers now, if you don't mind me asking what kind of answers have you come up with to describe the you know like ghost encounters and the void in the sky and things like that i mean i know you're you know a lot of your theories on reincarnation things like that but how does that you know is there any way you can shed some light on what these ghost encounters are and what they're trying to show us excuse me fellas sorry about that um no <laughs> the short answer is no i it goes back to that question of take ufos for instance where are they from to me, with the ghosts, the the question of what are they is sort of the same thing as asking, are you know, where are the UFOs from? Right. I, you know, I think they're all related. I think it's all part and parcel of the same thing. We're dealing with an advanced non-human intelligence, period. I can't tell you what that is. Some people would interpret it 
as God. Other people would interpret it as space aliens. Other people would interpret it, if you go the ghostly way, as the spirits of the dead. I definitely don't think it's the spirits of the dead. I'd like to think the afterlife is not quite so banal as right. being stuck in the same room for all of eternity, wandering around, haunting your great nephews or something. Okay. So, Or whoever buys the house you know, 200 years down the road. So to me, it's, it's kind of like a fun house or something. It, and it doesn't really matter where they're from or what they are. So I don't spend a whole lot of time worrying about what ghosts are or where UFOs might be from. To me, it's just one common denominator, one advanced non-human intelligence. And um, the, the really important thing is uh, how they're communicating with us and what they're trying to encourage us to do. And when I talk about this, I get some people who, um, uh, there's a, the, a message form that I, I still, I, st I joined years ago and I still sort of participate every now and then when I have some free time, called UFO Evolution. And I tried to, um, somebody asked me about this, they heard me on Coast to Coast, and I sort of tried to explain what I meant about this artistic thing in the communication. And there was this one guy who just kept coming back and he, he just kept saying, well, this doesn't make any sense. And it might not. I perfectly have to admit that what I'm saying might not make any sense. But his reasons for that um, were these are clearly aliens from other planets in, you know, nuts and bolts spacecraft. They're abducting people, all this other stuff. Why on earth would they, you know, what do you mean by an art ex exhibit? And I, all I could say was, well, first of all, I didn't say it was an exhibit. Um, I'm not talking about paintings in the Louvre or something like that. But every everything, it was so very literal. And at the end of it, of our interaction, I just kind of thought, I think you've just proved my point. Because clearly we are not capable of communicating with each other. You're not getting what I'm saying. And while I understand what you're saying, I don't really understand why you're saying it. So perhaps I didn't write this. I pro you know, I probably should have, but I've learned not to, not to get too angry on these message forms. But I kind of thought of writing something like, look, maybe we should both take crayons, go to our corner, draw some painting to do or the crayon picture to describe what we're feeling and post those on the Internet. And that'll be our way of communicating with each other, because that'll clearly be more productive than what we're doing right now. But but they didn't didn't get it. And I thought, is this me not being able to explain properly, which is kind of proving my point about the limits of verbal <laughs> communication or even written communication? And then I reread you know, the relevant parts of my book. And I thought, no, no, you know, because I think I'm pretty clear on this, that, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, what this is and provide a number of examples throughout the book, too, for instance, Cirque du Soleil is one of them. When you look at, um, <clears throat> I, I love Cirque du Soleil every time. It's, what is it? The Patton Oswalt skit. It's like catnip for old people. <laughs> yeah. But um, I'm not that old, but I, I still, I just, it, I love Cirque du Soleil every time I go to Vegas. Uh, and I've been there a number of times. I always go see a Cirque show. But, there's a, a story I talk about in the book because some people have kind of asked me, well, wait a second, what about scary stuff? Like you had scary things happen to you where you were afraid. And I went, yes. And well, that that's bad, right? That's got to be evil. We're dealing with something that's that's means to harm us. And I say, well, no. Does Roger Corman mean to harm you when he makes a horror film? Or did um, the guy who made The Exorcist, uh, Peter Blatty, mean to harm you when he made the, the Exorcist or, you know, any horror films? Or does does somebody, when, when you're at Cirque du Soleil and they do something scary, and I talked about this in the book, there was, when I was there in 2007, I saw a show called Mystere. And I was sitting with a friend of mine who was the narrator of um, Best Evidence, Chris McBride. She and I were traveling in the States. And there's these, I call them cat people, but they're, they're guys who are sort of dressed like cats or some strange creature. And the show was going on in the stage, and we're sitting in the front row of the second tier. So the um, the walkway is right in front of us, and there's a barrier in front of us. And you're not paying attention to what the cat people are doing. They've wandered off into the audience. You're looking at what's going on in the show. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, the idea of performance art is misdirection. Sometimes, you know, what's happening right in front of you isn't as important as what's about to happen that, you know, you haven't been paying attention to. Right. And sure enough, one of these cat people kind of wandered along the base of the the uh, partition, the barrier between us and the um, the rampway that separated the two sections, unbeknownst to us. I mean, and then just popped up right in front of Chris. Boom. And sort of right in front of me. But I was definitely like, you know, scared. We were all kind of momentarily scared. Like, <gasps> and then you realize, oh, it's just a cat person, not Chris. 
uh, you know, Chris was, I thought she was going to have a heart attack. She, she literally let out this yell. And if you want to talk about the co-creation of an artistic experience, she, I'm pretty sure that that cat guy, whoever it was that was playing that particular cat person that night, had never quite experienced something like what he got from Chris. She, <laughs> you know, the entire audience heard her. And he jumped back a good two or three feet. And she grabbed my arms like, ah! And so there you go. There's a guy, his purpose in doing that is to elicit a reaction, clearly. Mm -hmm. What he got was a reaction that elicited a reaction in him. So you've got the, this, this sort of, these two people who are having this moment together and then all the people surrounding them. She was like really afraid for a very short period of time. She did calm down and the cat guy kind of looked at us and went, are you, meow, are you okay? And then he wandered off yeah. to have his own heart checked. But afterwards, <laughs> when Chris and I were sort of talking about it after the show, I said, wow, that was freaky, wasn't it? You were scared. And she said, yeah, no, I was really scared. And neither of us thought that was a bad thing. She's, I, I remember what she said. She said, I felt so alive. You know, it, it literally was one of those things that if you, if you view your day-to-day -day existence as kind of a, let's say, on a scale of, of 1 to 100, it's the zero. Like yes. it's, the ba it's the baseline. Very mundane. So, yeah, no, well, not necessarily mundane, but yeah, sure, let's call it mundane. Well, my it's life. The base <laughs> okay, so is mine. You know, <laughs> that's the baseline. Anything that takes you above that is interesting, and it can be in any one of a number of ways. Music can take you above that. You can go to a concert and get in a mosh pit. That can take you above that. But fear can take you above that, too. One of the primal human emotions is fear. And I, I talk about that in the book. My own experiences as a kid in a haunted house, you know, one of the sort of stereotypical pay to get in haunted houses but you know chris's experience with the cirque du soleil and then my own ghost hunting experiences there's nothing inherently wrong with fear right fear is a good thing fear can protect you from harm for one thing but it can also you know just on a very basic human level remind you that you're alive and i guarantee you and if if chris was here she could guarantee you she definitely felt alive at that cirque du soleil show when the cat person popped his head up so when you you hear these stories of whatever the paranormal is you it could be ghosts it could be ufos it could be any manifestation of it but when you hear about people being frightened by it that's our reaction but that doesn't necessarily connote evil intent or or, or bad will towards us it's just one other any more than roger corman does when he makes a horror film or i'm making a horror film right now i i hope people are scared when they watch it yeah i, I totally agree I'm, with that premise or else i'm not doing a very good job yeah. But I also hope, you know, that nobody thinks that I'm an evil person for trying to scare them. And we willingly, you know, we willingly pay to go see stuff like that. We and, and for not just horror films, you could go on on these roller coasters, these massive roll which really scare me. These massive roller coasters, or you can jump out of planes with parachutes or all the other things that people do. They put their lives at risk. They embrace the thrill you want to call it thrill or fear or whatever to try and conquer that fear to try and feel an experience that takes them above that baseline of zero so again getting back to the paranormal if you view our lives as the baseline of zero or one or whatever you want to me the paranormal is something it's an attempt to remind us that it the scale goes to 100 and you know maybe it goes to infinity but to encourage us to move beyond that baseline of just our day-to-day lives of getting up, going to work, coming home, watching American Idol, going to bed. There's far more interesting things out there that we should and could be thinking about. And when people say, well, what's the message they give? There has to be a message, right? They have to be imparting a cure for cancer to us or, you know, advanced military technology. They're trying to give us that, right? So no, they're not trying to give us anything any more than we do the homework for our children. You'd be a lousy parent if you did your kid's homework. At least I think you would. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you can't encourage your kid to study, to read, to learn. You shouldn't encourage your kid to do their homework. And if the kid asks, you might actually you know, provide some assistance, but you can't give them the answers. That would be wrong. Because then the kid doesn't learn anything. They have to figure it out themselves. So to, to me, that's what the parent, in terms of that, so people are waiting for whatever the paranormal is to give us the cure for cancer or to you know give us better bombers and and drones to blow people up or whatever they think they're going to give us or even the se secret of life i said that's not coming they want us to do that work um all they're doing is providing us with the inspiration maybe to mm -hmm. um, to think about it 
Yeah, you mentioned kids and probably the most unexpected topic in the other side of truth. Something that I'm really curious about is reincarnation and past lives, a topic that's definitely been marginalized in the Western world. But I was surprised to see that in your book. But what are your thoughts on reincarnation? Yeah, that was I was surprised to see it in my book, too, <laughs> because it's not um, a subject that I had really sort of looked into, although I've certainly I'd always been fascinated by it and familiar mm -hmm. with it. But my you know, I'm a hopeful agnostic when it comes to anything to do with um, in quotation marks, religion or God or whatever you right. want to call it. Um, so in terms of reincarnation, I'm, I'm definitely open minded. It makes sense to me. I, yeah, I kind of I went through this thought experiment when I was writing the book and it kind of comes out in the book. Does the very idea of reincarnation make sense to me? And it sort of does. In the sense that, assuming that the three of us who are all men living in North America at this particular time in history, our average life expectancy is probably about 80 years, give or take. Mm -hmm. By the time we hit 80, it'll probably be up to 85 or 90. But that's a relatively, it's not even relative, that's an extremely short period of time of existence in, on this plane. Um, and there's only so many things you can learn in that period of existence. Well, if we're meant, you know, to experience as many things as possible, mm -hmm. then it makes sense to me if there is any life after death, whatever, however you, whatever religious tradition or spiritual tradition you want to pigeonhole that in, um, doesn't matter. But if that concept is real, if there is something beyond this, and I tend to think that there is without being absolutely sure of it, then it makes sense to me that it would be reincarnation, that it wouldn't be us going to the Elysian fields or to the magic kingdom in the sky or whatever, or hell or, or any of those places. It would be that we would continue to get recycled back here and have different experiences. So if I'm out drinking and I have a, you know, I'm in a particularly sarcastic mood and I really want to upset people, I will, I have been known to actually, you know, sort of pontificate about how I was probably an SS concentration camp guard in a previous life. <laughs> and they're like, that's, oh my God, how could you even think of that? That's horrible. You were at Auschwitz and killing people. I said, yeah, you know what? It's all part of the thing. If <laughs> yeah. you look at the reincarnate, if you look at multiple lives, it would stand to reason that at some point we would have to do all of it. So at some point we would have to be the SS concentration camp guard or the Roman centurion, you know, crucifying people on the Appian Way after Spartacus's revolution or whatever, all these bad things that people do. And on the other side of the coin, at some point in our life, we'd have to be the, the monk or the, you know, the great holy man or whatever, who is, who's actually trying to help people and the philosophy. And we'd have to be the garbage man and, and everything. It's kind of like the episode of Star Trek where the Q continuum and they say, look, every I've been, I want to die because I've been the scarecrow, I've been the dog, I've been the newspaper, I've done, you know, I've, I've literally been everything. So to get the full range of human experience, you'd have to be, you'd have to be both the concentration camp guard and you'd have to be at some point the inmate in different lives and different concentration camps. But that idea, of course, that makes, that makes sense to me if you're looking at having an afterlife, because otherwise, how could we be fully formed human beings, souls, whatever, because you'd have the guy who was the concentration camp inmate, you'd have the guy who was the concentration camp guard, and then you'd have me, who is neither. And if you're going to, like, unless you really do believe there is one supreme being who is literally judging us all for only having one chance, we don't even get three strikes and you're out like you do in some American states. You'd have one strike, one life, that's it. If you screw it up, you're done. Eternal damnation. It just doesn't, I mean, that just doesn't resonate with me. I can't no, say, no, no. I can't say any of this makes sense to me. So I won't say it doesn't make sense to me. It just doesn't resonate with me as being even remotely logical or fair or anything else. What does seem logical and fair to me, if you posit an afterlife, is many afterlifes, many different experiences. I even talk in the book about how you would come back as a bat or a snail. I mean, think about how old the universe is, how mm -hmm. long this sort of construct has been here billions and billions of years. Well, if I live to be 90 years old, and I hope I do, um, that isn't even to say that's a that's not even a grain of sand on a very big beach of the universal time scale. Right. 
So when you sit back and you kind of look at it that way and you say, well, okay, reincarnation starts to make sense to me. And then when you look at it within the paranormal, you try and link up in terms of the paranormal. A couple other things came out of it to me that make sense too. One of which is what happens when you've had all those experiences, assuming you maybe someday you do, or at least you've had enough that you've learned as much as you can as an individual and you've accumulated this body of knowledge. Now, you don't remember it. I come back, say I was the concentration camp guard. Well, I don't remember being him. That For a whole host of reasons, that wouldn't make sense. You have to have a completely new experience. But then you, when you die, you would go off um, sort of, let's call it a clearinghouse. You chop and say, great, okay, it's like changing uniforms. All right, great, I'm going to, you know, we're changing clothes. I'm just going to leave this suit here and I'm going to put a new suit on. I'm going to go out again. And then when I come back, I'll put a new suit on again. But I still have all the suits, unless you throw them out. So, and don't throw the suits out, folks. <laughs> you know, keep the suits. So, eventually, your closet is full. Oh, I like that. I'll have to put that in my next book. So, yeah, eventually, your closet is full. And, uh, and then you say, okay, well, what do I do now? It strikes me that, you know, what you would do now is you'd move on. You'd be ready to move on to the next thing. And to me, the next thing would be a collective consciousness where you kind of like, oh, this is horrible. I keep dropping Star Trek and Star Wars references. But no, like in cool. Star Trek, you know, Star Trek, I got criticized. Somebody criticized me on a blog or something and said, you know, this is the kind of shallow thinking you hear in the paranormal because all it's a bunch of middle-aged men, basically, who grew up watching sci-fi and they're just regurgitating sci-fi ideas in the form of, you know, paranormal pop psychology or something. It's like, really? That's, no. You know, it's a pretty limited view of what science fiction represents. But anyway, here I go. So in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, they had Odo, this character, and he was part of the great, you know, he was an individual, but he also belonged to this thing called the Great Link with the founders or whatever. And and that's an idea that resonates with me, too, that you hear so many people talk about how we're all linked together. And, you know, various people talking about ideas of collective consciousness and stuff. And I don't think they really actually stop to think about what that would mean. You yeah. can't, you can't. This idea, I, I know a lot of, I have a lot of evangelical relatives who are very dear people. Oh, I'm sorry. But you, but you hear, no, no, they, my grandfather was a, reformed <laughs> I'm just Baptist, kidding. was a reformed Baptist minister. I mean, I have a great deal of respect for these folks. But when you talk to people and they say, well, we're going to die and we're going to go to heaven and we'll see our loved ones in heaven. Really? Um, so you're literally going to just show up in heaven kind of the way you are now as, as you, as that individual? So does that mean that the Rockefellers show up in heaven as those individuals? Well, that how does that make any sense to me? Because, say, this guy went to Harvard. So everything, his life experiences will now translate to heaven. Your life experiences will translate to heaven. So you're telling me heaven has the same class system that we have here on Earth? Well, what's the point? I don't want to go to heaven then. <laughs> yeah, of Because, course, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm middle class here. I don't want to be middle class in heaven. Although the so Rockefellers they, might be in hell. They might be, although who knows? I don't. I don't believe that there would be such a thing as hell. Uh, other no, than maybe, no, me well, either. We, other than maybe where we are right now. Um, True. By which I don't mean this particular conversation. Although anyone who's listening may think otherwise. <laughs> so, this you're not going to go. You wouldn't exist. I can't see how you'd exist as as an individual, as Paul Kimball or 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 anybody who who is existing here. What makes more sense to me is. And if you look at a lot of the literature where people talk about near-death experiences, which is a subject that I'm fascinated by but I didn't get into in the book, um, or, or any of these sorts of things, they talk much more about joining something and becoming part of something. And it frightens us. Many people find that concept frightening because they talk about losing who they are. I don't look at it that way. I talk about you know, enhancing who we are and joining, returning to... You know, maybe the one great link, if you will. So I think I briefly in the book, I think I talk about this idea that we are, if you view all life in the universe as an email, well, what is an email? It's, um, it's a form of communication that's basically broken up into its constituent parts and then reassembled at the end of the chain, which is your computer. So maybe we're all parts of that email, um, this cosmic email, if you will. And at the end, we all get reassembled back into the original message. So when people talk, ask me, you know, what do I think the paranormal is? You know, what's the message? And I say, well, maybe we're the message. And maybe what we're dealing with, maybe this advanced non-human intelligence, is this collective consciousness. It's 
where we go, whether you believe in reincarnation, so maybe you cycle through multiple lives and eventually you choose to join this collective consciousness. Well, then maybe that's what we're dealing with. And it's providing us with glimpses, with, you know, a pathway to get there eventually. Um, or maybe you don't have reincarnation and maybe when we die, we just join this collective consciousness. Or maybe we're part of it anyway. Maybe it exists even as we exist. I don't know. There's any one of the number of ways of looking at it. Yeah. But we're all part of something bigger than just ourselves. If nothing else, if everything that I just said is completely, as my British friends would say, bollocks, um, or untrue, or or bonkers, or whatever, it's still not a bad way of thinking about things. Because if you start to think of ourselves as part of something bigger than just ourselves, then you might become just a better human being in terms of dealing with your fellow human beings. True. It makes it it makes it much harder to hurt people or to do Absolutely. bad things if you look at them and say we're all part of the same thing, aren't we? And so it's much easier to do those things if you can marginalize them and say, you're different than I am for whatever reason. So I can treat you as the Nazis would have said subhumans or non-humans. I think that's, if nothing else, you know, if, if that's what people take out of my book, the idea that maybe we're all part of something bigger, so we should be nicer to people, then that's probably not a bad, bad thing. Absolutely. And uh, I, I have one question about the uh, reincarnation subject matter, if you will. Uh, well, what are your thoughts on uh, like regressive hypnotherapy and, you know, past life regression, and things like that? I mean, do you think that's a legitimate thing? Do you think we can like access these corners of our minds or these corners of our spirits or what have you and uh, wind up seeing or f figuring out who we used to be at some point? Or do you think that's just a big load of crap? Maybe when you're a kid. Yeah, it's a couple of things. First of all, I used to be very, I still am, um, very critical of hypnosis as a tool for retrieving memory. There's a reason, you you know, courts of law won't use it. Um, it's inherently unreliable. It's been repeatedly proven to be unreliable. And to a point where if you do come to rely on it, it can be very damaging um, to people, both the people who are hypnotized but also the people that maybe they accuse of something after they come out of hypnosis. Um, there's been child abuse scandals that have been launched by this kind of retrieval of past memories that have been proven to be completely fallacious, but it's ruined people's lives between point A and point B where they figure out that none of this was true. Al the alien, quote, quote, alien abduction thing, I've been very critical of that too, and I remain critical. I think people are doing far more damage to people than we ever sort of really think about. So having said that, however, that doesn't mean as I've gotten older and I've thought about it a bit more, doesn't mean that I completely rule out hypnosis for a couple of reasons and for a couple of things. One thing I do talk about in the book, and this gets back to um, the idea of taking ayahuasca or whatever, mm -hmm. is how do, you, how do you make contact with the paranormal? And I talk about buying a ticket if you do it like any art an art gallery or a Cirque du Soleil show or whatever you have to buy a ticket to get in to see Cirque du Soleil so people can talk about seeing Cirque du Soleil all they want but unless you bought the ticket you're not actually going to see the show or even even if you watch it on the internet for free you still have to make the effort to log on to YouTube or something and call up the Cirque du Soleil show so you have to make an effort to do it and maybe that's what me going to a cemetery in Shocklack, England, or um, somebody who goes out and takes ayahuasca, or somebody who sits down and, and has hypnosis done on them, maybe that's part of buying a ticket. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the act of buying a ticket, it, indicating a willingness to have some form of communication, some form of paranormal experience. Yeah. Okay, I'm fine with that. And I, I, I wouldn't even rule out hypnosis, although I, I certainly would never recommend it, but you never know. Maybe... That's a way of buying a ticket. Um, you should, what I would caution against is relying on what you take out of any of those experiences, a particular meaning. Because I think the one thing that I've been pretty consistent about um, talking to you guys, but also in the book and everything else, is that there isn't a linear message that's being communicated to us. So it's not like they're giving us the cure for cancer or, or anything else. So if you take out of any of these experiences a particular message 
I think you're actually missing the message, which is you're not missing the message. But if 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 you think that that's the only thing that it could be, then you're missing the message, mm -hmm. um, because there's multiple interpretations that are possible, like looking at a Jackson Pollock painting. So if you're just there to use it as a door opening to um, to take a ride and have some fun and and imagine and think, then I think maybe it's not such a bad thing. Um, on the other hand, if you're using it to retrieve what you think are dyed in the wool, absolutely specific memories of something, then I think that's very dangerous. So I, there is a difference between the two. Um, in terms of retrieving memories of past lives, maybe, but I would like to think that those things would be closed off to us, or at the very least, maybe we just get glimpses and one of you, I, I can't remember which one mentioned children. I do talk about that in the book mm -hmm. because when I was a kid, I had, I can still remember it. I would be lying on a couch. It was always on a couch reading. And more than once when I, you know, this is before I turned 10. So while I was still relatively young, suddenly I would I literally, I'd have this um, feeling of falling. Um, so, the, you know, the wind, not just a physical sensation within my stomach, although I get that too, you know, where your stomach churns. If you've ever been on a roller coaster, you know what it feels like. Yeah. But literally hearing and feeling the wind rushing by me as I would be going down stopped happening. Um, I, I couldn't tell you what, you know, eight, nine, seven, when it stopped happening. But it eventually stopped happening. And then, you know, I kind of forgot about it um, or at least didn't think about it. But looking back on it now, all these years later, thinking about reincarnation and past lives, the possibility strikes me that maybe, you know, that's, you don't get, like somebody doesn't show up and say, you were Napoleon. Everybody's yeah. always Napoleon. Why is everybody always <laughs> Napoleon? I, or somebody famous, you know, you were famous. Nobody ever says, oh, I had hypnosis and I was a ditch, you know, I was a serf in 1374 and I get, you know, the, some noble came by, um, you know, raped my wife, burned my farm, and then, and then stuck my head on a pitchfork. Nobody ever has that experience. Yeah. So, um, but which is far more likely that they would have had that experience than, you know, being Napoleon. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you get a, a literal recitation of sort of your life history from a past life, kind of like reading an obituary or a biography. I think what you might get are glimpses maybe like i maybe sort of got of the wind rushing so then i think well okay did i in a previous life did i fall off a cliff um you know did i was i hanged um anything that would did i jump out of an airplane and not the parachute didn't open i don't know so you start to wonder okay maybe you just get those glimpses and again the the purpose of that is not to give you the exact biography of who you are any more than the purpose of anything with the paranormal is to give you an exact message like here's the cure for cancer but to sort of maybe make you think and mm -hmm. give you a clue or a hint or just, you know, a gentle little nudge, which is usually what the best art does. It just kind of inspires you to think. And then it lets you sort of, and then it says, well, okay, we don't care which one of these paths you take. Just take a path. Don't keep standing here. And mm -hmm. I think that's what the paranormal is designed to do when it comes to these sort of past life experiences. I think that's what it's designed to do. Uh, I, if, if there is something to this past life stuff. I don't think, though, that you're going to get your, no matter how you go about doing it, you're going to find out you were Napoleon or a particular guy. I, I've read about people who say, I was this guy in 18, you know, he lived from 1824 to 1882 and he was killed on the front. Really? How do you, I, sorry, that's where they lose me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, mm -hmm. Because I don't think it's about any particular life. It's about just all of them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's, it comes back to this idea of the collective consciousness I don't think it's about me or you or, or who we are in terms of particular, in terms of any one experience. I just think it's about all of it. And then it, it kind of meshes into the to the goo, if you will, at the end of the uh, at the end of the road. And you're something much more profound. You're the sum of all your experiences. And if you look at our own lives, that's what we are. I was talking to my friend Tim Benal on on his show, and he was having a lot of <laughs> He was having a lot of trouble. He admitted he was having a lot of trouble with the idea of the collective consciousness. And I said, Tim, you're a collective consciousness. So am I. You know what we're a collective consciousness of? Our own life experiences. Every night you go to bed, you die. And every morning you wake up, you're born again. Yeah. You know, you're a different person. Shorter person chapters. Per yeah, it, absolutely. But I am a, I'm a radically different person than I was when I was five and when I was 20 and when I was 30. 
And if I go any further, people might figure out, you know, just how old I am. You know, I'm 46. In those 46 years, you could count every single day and I've lived a different lifetime. But even if you didn't want to look at it that way, think about what it would be if you take half of your life. So say you're 40 and you go back half to when you were 20. If you're 30, you can go back to when you were 15. Would you even, would that person even recognize who you are now? And the answer is probably no. And I don't just mean physically. I mean just in terms of all the experiences you've had. So every experience you have changes who you are. You become a different person. So we're doing it every day, whether we like it or not. All I'm talking about doing is, is doing it over multiple lifetimes and then taking all those experiences and joining something even, or rejoining perhaps something even bigger. It's nothing, yeah. that, should, it's nothing that should frighten people. It's something that I think should really excite them. You know, I've always liked the Alan Watts explanation because he always he you know he's always into the idea that we're all God, and that's kind of a abstract concept. But he basically says, you know, if you were a eternal being, an all powerful God, and you went through thousands and thousands of years just having everything you wanted, manifesting whatever you wanted, you'd get bored, and the only then if you tried to enact thrills, the only way you could really do it is without memory. So it kind of ties into the startling Catman performance that you were a part of is without, if you know everything, if you're all knowing, you're not going to have any kind of surprise in life. And that is a, a, a real thrill. So I really like his, his um, interpretation of it or his explanation of it. And then he says, you have to have different lives with no memory of the past ones to really have new experiences, to really have excitement. Otherwise, it would be very mundane to have a memory that lasts 100,000 years and knowing that when you die, it's just going to be another life. If you knew that, it wouldn't. there would be no thrill to it. And I think that's a really easy way to conceive of that idea. Sure, yeah, not just no thrill to it, but I don't, you'd, be, you'd be constrained – There'd be no opportunity to learn. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right, that too. Because you'd be constrained by who you were before. So to use my concentration camp guard example, um, there's no way that if you brought that person into a new life with memories of his, who he was in his past life, that there would be any learning because they would be sort of bound by who they were, the same bigoted, biased, prejudiced, violent behavior that they exhibited before. That's part of the human condition. It, unfortunately, it's part of who we are. But if he was to have a different, ex going to have a different experience, you know, you'd have to start fresh. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you know, there, there's also something to be said for familiarity and comfort and, you know, not completely losing everything. So I don't, I don't think you lose everything. I, I just think you, it's like a suit, you know, you just, you put on a different suit, but your other suits are all still in the closet. And then maybe when you're done, you pack up all your suits and you go somewhere else and um, with your full wardrobe. So I don't know, th that makes sense to me, but it probably doesn't make any sense to anybody listening. So I'll have to work on coming up with a better example than the suit example. <laughs> I love no, that. Yeah, that was a good example. Now, I do have a question on all that, though. Uh, you know, as far as not remembering your past and things like that, I mean, if we did remember, if we could find somehow find a way to remember that stuff, wouldn't that – couldn't that be a potential good thing because then you'd always strive to better yourself from the past? I mean, that's what I do in my daily life anyway. I'm always trying to better myself, better my family situation, things like that. So if I could remember – what has happened in the past, you know, with a different life, if, you know, reincarnation was real, then that would give me kind of fuel for the fire to keep striving to make a better life. I mean, it, it gave you a chance to learn from the past and things like that. So now how can I do it differently this time? You'd think so. And that it's good that you can do that. I try to do that. <laughs> Most of us know. Most of us don't learn from the past. Most of us continue to repeat, even as, uh, and I talk about this in the book and the the sort of penultimate chapter about the human condition, we continue to repeat the same mistakes that we've made. We generally speaking don't learn um, as, a, as a species from all of the terrible things that we've done. So you would, for instance, perfect example, First World War. At the end of the First World War, almost everybody said, we can never let this happen again. We just killed millions of people. Um, an entire generation really of young men wiped out in, in Europe. This can this is so horrific. This can never happen again. 
clearly we will never let this happen again. So they created the League of Nations and all of these things that were designed to make sure that this would never happen again. And then as soon as they created the League of Nations, the United States, one of the major powers, said, well, we don't want to join. Big political fight in the U.S. and they decided we don't want to join. And the whole thing kind of never really, you know, without one of the major world powers, it never really kind of amounted to anything. And 20 years later, they were doing it all over again, only better. They were killing even more people. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, they develop nuclear weapons, which have the ability to kill, and they use them, which have the ability to kill even more people than you can possibly imagine. And it, we came very close in the Cuban Missile Crisis, very, very close, to actually launching a nuclear war. And you would have general after general on all sides who would say, we can actually win this thing. So there's a perfect example right there of, of how you would think you should learn, how people said they were going to learn, and yet they didn't learn. And they repeated the behavior. The same people, mm -hmm. the people who were fighting, who were generals in the Second World War, had most of them had fought in the First World War. They were the very same people who said we should never let this happen again. And, and here we are in 2013, and all the lines have been drawn in the sand again, and in World War III yeah. is pretty much knocking on our door. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I don't know if World War III is knocking on our door, but I don't know if we need a World War III because we've got so many other little wars going on. We're in a, a state of perpetual war, which, if you look in human history, we've always been in a state of perpetual war. Mm -hmm. Some of them are really big. Those are the ones we remember, like World War II, World War I the U.S. Civil War. I mean, you can pick them out of whatever country you're talking about, you can find the war. But if you look at human history, there's it's all the little wars that you never remember that kind of add up to be, well, we're always at war, aren't we? When people write the history of the 21st century in a thousand years, nobody's going to remember the names, Norman Schwarzkopf, David Petraeus, none of those guys, you know, McChrystal, all the generals in Iraq and Afghanistan, they're probably not even going to remember Afghanistan they might, you know, Iraq might get a page or two, but probably not any more than if you look at British history outside of certain, you know, British historians. Most people don't remember the wars that the British fought in the 19th century. Um, Afghanistan, yes, we remember the British were there, sort of, I guess. The Boer War, there's a statue to the Boer War here in Halifax because we send volunteers. But I mean, ask most people the Boer War and they, their eyes roll into the back of the head and they go, what? You no, know, it was a three years major conflict the British fought at the turn of the century that almost launched uh, a world war because the Germans were supporting the Boers. Long story. Nobody remembers it, but it was the most important thing that was going at the time in the United Kingdom. So nobody's going to remember Afghanistan. Nobody's going to remember Iraq. Probably Vietnam is not going to be ter remembered very well uh, in a couple hundred years. So that yeah. kind of puts things in perspective to you, too, that what seems very important to us you know, in the grand scheme of things, probably not so important. But the one thing that you can take away from all of that, even as you forget the names, is that it's always happening. We're always fighting about something. And the people that we celebrate, and I do talk about this in the book a bit, um, generally speaking, are the more violent types. Most people today, if you were to, I use this as an example, if you were to take 100 people on the street, just any street anywhere in the United States or Canada, and run two names by them. Now, I'm pretty sure that most people wouldn't know either of them, but more people would know George Patton's name or Douglas MacArthur's name mm -hmm. than would know Dog Hammarskjöld. To me, that's a terrible, terrible thing because <laughs> Patton and MacArthur you know, were generals who killed people, even though they were on what we like to think of, and which was the right side in the Second World War still, their job was killing people. Dog Hammarskjöld was a secretary general of the United Nations. His job was saving lives, creating peace. He was killed. He died in a plane crash trying to broker a, a peace agreement in an African conflict. Nobody remembers Dog Hammarskjöld outside of some UN staffers and some school kids who go to model United Nations. More people know Patton and Rommel and, and MacArthur and those kinds of people. And I think that's a that's a bad thing. That, that says a lot about us. So... You know, and, and people will be listening. Oh, I thought they were going to talk about ghosts and UFOs. What are they talking about? But to me, that's what the paranormal is about. It's what it's always been about. It's about trying to make us, trying to show us a better path, trying to, anytime you can encourage people to imagine and to think and to think about something more than just themselves, then I think they become better people. And I think they have a greater awareness of other people around them and are less likely to do them harm and more likely to want to get to know them and to share their experiences. If 
I look at the paranormal and I say, well, that's what the advanced non-human intelligence is, is trying to do. Because if it wanted to hurt us, it could. If it really has the powers we ascribe to it, whether it's space aliens from Zeta Reticuli coming down and using you know, laser beams to flatten cities. I mean, we can flatten cities. Imagine what a race coming from another planet in another part of the galaxy could do. We can blow up the entire world ourselves. Yeah. What could they do? Wouldn't take them more than five seconds. So when you see a movie like Battle of Los Angeles or Independence Day, they're ridiculous. The idea that we could resist an alien invasion is crazy. Or God. You know, if you're talking about a God, well, he, he flooded the earth, right? <laughs> you know, 40 days and 40 nights. He really is God, mm -hmm. and he created the universe. There's not a whole lot we can do to stop him if he wants to do us harm. Yeah. So whatever the advanced on human intelligence is, it would have powers far in advance of anything that we could imagine. If it really wanted to hurt us, it could. The fact that it hasn't, you know, we're still here, right? So the fact that it hasn't tells me that it's not here to hurt us. Yeah, that's not the point. The um, two um. possibilities left are benign neglect, meaning it just doesn't really care. I don't buy that because it does seem to want to interact with us at least some of us, those of us that are willing to buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. So it can't just be, I don't see it as being just neglect. That leaves just to me one other possibility, which is it's here to, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll help us. Now people say, help, well, where's the cure for cancer? I say, well, that's a pretty linear, short-sighted way of looking right. at help. That's what we might think of as help, but they're taking a much, they would take a much longer view, um, given that the universe is billions of years old and vast and we're just a teeny tiny small part of it the cure for cancer doesn't really mean a whole lot in the grand scheme of things um, what means a lot is encouraging us to think in different ways and then who knows maybe one of those people who thinks in different ways will be inspired to use their scientific training and knowledge and smarts instead of building a better way to kill people maybe they'll channel their energies into finding a cure for cancer but we have to do the work right and I mean, hey, this is this is getting to about the top of the hour. There was one completely unrelated thing I wanted to ask you a little bit about because I saw this when I was going into your bio, and I haven't gotten a chance to see it. But another documentary you made is Fields of Fear about the mystery of cattle mutilations, and it's something that I was really curious about as a kid, but I haven't heard much about it in recent years. It's kind of been on the back burner of of paranormal and UFO research, it seems. But can you tell me a little bit about the material in that film? Did you come to any conclusions about cattle mutilations or any reasonable explanation? Sure. Actually, um, given that I've just spent the entire show saying I basically don't know, <laughs> right? it'll be good to actually end on on saying, yes, I do know. Um, it was a, yeah, it was a, I was profiling as a biography, really, of a Canadian rancher named Fern Belzil in Alberta, who spent, he's retired, I think he's probably over 80 now, but he had spent about 10 years investigating alleged cattle mutilations in the western region of Canada. And he was convinced that there was something anomalous to it. I, and he was sort of convinced, although he would never actually come right out and say it, that it was space aliens. Mm -hmm. But um, he was definitely convinced there was something anomalous. So I, you know, I made the film and I, he had his say, there were other people in the film who, who talked about different things. But the conclusions I came to were, were different to me. The answer is clear. There's nothing anomalous about it. Uh, these are nat animals who died natural deaths. And th what you're seeing is the result of predation and scavenging from other animals. Really? And so people, whenever you hear this, you hear this often. Linda Moulton Howe has, has made a, a very good living, um, for which I don't begrudge her. That's fine. But talking about cattle mutilations kind of made her name on it with a couple of films back That's in the true. 1980s. Yeah. And she and, and most of the other people that talk about it, are, they always reference these police officers. They reference two things. One, farmers. And they say, well, farmers know their animals. Well, it's true. Farmers do know their animals. But farmers, and I mean no offense to farmers here, they're not veterinary pathologists. They're not experts they're experts in certain parts of animal husbandry, but they're not experts in a whole wide range of any other things to deal with animals. I, you know, I'm an expert in, in humans because I live with them, but I'm not a doctor and I'm certainly not a, a coroner. So if somebody came to me and said, you know, Paul, you deal with humans every day, right? You know, because you employ some of them and you work with them and you live with them. Yes, it's true. I do. But here's the thing. I couldn't tell you what killed that guy because that's not what I'm an expert in. 
And the, the police officers, the same thing is true. You hear the descriptions from police officers say, this police officer looked at this um, sort of cut or whatever on an animal, and it was made with laser-like precision. Well, the first question I would ask the police officer after that is, so exactly where have you ever seen laser cuts before on flesh? I mean, if you have, let me know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But to the best of my knowledge, the answer from all of them is going to be Star Wars or whatever. And even, even in science fiction, you generally don't see, you just see the stormtroopers get hit and you don't really see the wounds. So you're just laser-like precision, really? Okay. Here's the thing. There was, um, there's a whole bunch of reports. Everybody talks about Ken Rommel, who was this FBI agent who was commissioned by the government in the United States in New Mexico to look into this. He came up with a 300-page report, said it's basically predation and scavenging and a couple other things thrown in, but it's all explainable. Hmm. They should have bought it then. But nobody did. They said, oh, he's biased and he was working for the government, whatever. Um, there's a, you never hear referenced. There are a number of academic articles. articles. There's one in particular in the, it was weird because, well, it's not weird. I, I understand why. Fern had never heard of it. I posted it on a number of websites. I included it in my film, which folks can see. Again, go to our website. It's available. You can watch it for free online, the entire film. Come to your own conclusions. But it was an article in the Canadian Veterinary Journal didn't take me long to find it right there here are veterinary pathologists who took a serious look at cattle mutilations in the 19 i believe it was the late 1980s although it might have been the early 1990s but you know well after linda moulton howe and all these other people had made their films and stuff they said okay we'll take this seriously we'll take a look at it and they in i think it's an eight page article with photos and everything here's the explanation folks i mean this and they explain as veterinary pathologists would do you know what how it causes it so when people say well it's predators and and no it's not predators of course it couldn't be because you know an animal wouldn't you know, do this and do that well no the the animals die of natural causes and then you when you start talking to people who work with animals they um they'll tell you how these things sort of work so people often for instance people will say well there's no tracks around the animal body okay that's true Kevin Randall, who's a UFO investigator in the United States, who's in the film. So he's a, he's a guy, he's one of the Roswell investigators. He believes aliens have come from space. So he's clearly not an arch, dyed-in-the-wool debunker. So this is a guy who believes aliens crashed at Roswell. But Kevin looked into the cattle mutilation thing, came to the same conclusion that I did, which is, you know, it's it's it can all be explained. He said, well, of course, if you don't see tracks around, well, birds are scavengers as well. So the birds land on the animal. And then the first thing that the birds will go for is the fleshy part. So you'll often, with not every, every, not all cattle mutilations are the same, but one of the common um, sort of things that you hear is the, the insides of the animal were pulled out, amazingly pulled out. Well, yeah, sure, that's because animals, birds, but also animals like weasels and all sorts of other predators, they literally burrow right into the animal, pull the insides out, because that's the part they want to eat, of course. It's the juicy bits. Mm hmm and you don't, you know, you don't really, there's, they don't rip the animal open. Other animals will pull pieces of the flesh off of the, the hide. Wolves, I was, my cameraman, when I was out filming Fields of Fear, he had actually worked on um, wolf documentaries for a top researcher into wolves. I had never heard this, but one of the things you'll hear is sometimes the tail will be missing off animals or patches of skin will be torn off. And he said, well, yeah, the animals tear those off. They'll stick their teeth in pull the pieces of flesh off and then they use them as playthings, you know, to bat around yeah. and stuff like that. Like dogs, like we give dogs. Yeah, my cat does that. Yeah, there you go. When you think about it, take your, well, I wouldn't recommend this to anyone, but if you have hangnails, you get a hangnail, you pull the hangnail back, right? The piece of skin back and you pull it off. Well, what happens? If you look at it closely, I have one now. I mean, it can look like, you know, a pretty clean break. You don't see this jagged sort of all these teeth or anything, they just grab one part and they'll pull it back. And when you think about it, what's going to happen when you pull it back? It's like opening a package. You're going to pull the paper and you're going to rip the paper in a relatively straight line. If you're a police officer who's not an expert in those kinds of things, you might even be inclined to say when you see something like that, that it was made with laser light precision because that's how you think. But yeah, when you, when you read these articles and they are out there from people who've looked at, who know what they're talking about, who don't have an ulterior agenda, 
who honestly look into it because they're trying to see if there is something strange going on here, not just maybe aliens, but trying to figure out, look, is there something that isn't natural happening? Because that would be a serious thing. They've all come to the conclusion, no, there isn't. All of this can be explained. And what it is, is it's a lot of fear mongering and that sort of thing that's going on. And frankly, I think it's a disservice to the paranormal, to the real subject of the paranormal, which is wondrous and mysterious and, and all sorts of really cool things to get hunkered down into the subject of cattle mutilations, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, the idea that space aliens would fly all the way here from Zeta Reticuli or whatever, just to kill a few cows and <laughs> rip their skin off and that sort of thing. I mean, when you step back from it, if that's, if that's sort of how mundane the paranormal really is and the space aliens really are, then I'm just going to start watching American Idol because you know that's not terribly yeah. interesting. So I'd like to think that if space aliens are coming here, it's for they're a little more advanced than just basically hyped up college students running really strange lab experiments on our on our cattle. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why we don't hear much about it anymore, is because it, the, it's probably been settled somewhat. I always thought it seemed really odd. I thought maybe it was probably military testing, if anything, military weapons testing. But, I mean, I guess it makes sense. I don't know much about dead animals. so. Well, the only, the only possible explanation I could think of that might be beyond the predation and the scavenging is not paranormal. It would involve governmental testing of the cattle herds because of BSE and the various, you know, mad cow disease and the various yes. other things that might be, and there's an awful lot of conspiracy mongering that fits into a whole sort of right wing, um, anti-government conspiracy, the world's coming to an end kind of meme that takes place in a lot of the paranormal subculture. I wouldn't, I wouldn't completely rule something like that out, but I'd almost completely rule it out. I've never seen any evidence that would support it. So barring, you know, some sort of shocking evidence that would come forward where somebody would say, yeah, I was part of that and that's what we were doing. I find it hard to believe that as as competent as our military seems to be and our secret, you know, there's clearly intelligence operations that go on that we don't know about sometimes until decades later. But something on the scale of cattle mutilations, um, there's, there's no evidence there that would convince me that that kind of activity is going on because we just haven't seen, we haven't seen enough evidence of it. Yeah. Well, sorry if that seems terribly disappointing. No, it's For cool. Anybody who want, wants to believe that you know the military is harvesting our cattle or whatever, um, but there would be better ways for them to do it than, even if you think of it logically, than, than doing this. Yeah. And if you ever get caught, the one thing about, the one thing if you study intelligence operations long enough, if you study the way the government works, the intelligence agencies work, um, which I have, is, they're risk adverse, which is to say. Generally speaking, with a few exceptions in human history, but generally speaking, they don't want to do something um, that is going to run the risk of creating a massive blowback if they're ever discovered. And if something like this, if you take a look at the BSE, the experimenting on the herds of cattle, all that sort of stuff, that's the kind of thing that most intelligence agencies, being tremendously risk adverse, would run away from screaming given and and that's that's not idle speculation that's looking at the history of how intelligence agencies behave mm. um, generally speaking they're not a bunch of cowboys no pun intended they're not a bunch of cowboys out there just running wild and crazy experiments occasionally you see that kind of thing happen and they are always eventually called to account for it and somebody always says ugh, ugh, we can never do this again you know right. but then again you know, we always do these things again, so it's possible. I just don't think it's probable. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's plenty of other mysteries out there that haven't been solved, so it's... And it is what it is, but that pretty much does it for us, Paul. It's been great. It seems like the net keeps getting cast a bit wider, and what I mean by that is in terms of UFOs and psychedelic experiences and ghosts and entities, 
that people have really started to think of them as part of the same phenomenon in recent years. Now you've made me think of it also in terms as a paranormal art form, which kind of relates to the muse concept and general artistic expression. So this thing, this as elusive as it can be, seems to be attached to more and more areas of our reality. And maybe that means we're getting closer to some truth. But before we let you go, tell the people where they can find your work and check in on you on, online and what you're working on next. Sure. My central website is, my company's website is uh, redstarfilmtv.com. That, so that's uh, R-E-D-S-T-A-R-F-I-L-M-T-V.com. And uh, most of my films are online through various distributors like UFO TV, so you can see them on YouTube. But that website, I have links to everything, central repository. So that's where you can find me. What I'm working on, I'm just finishing up a feature film right now, actually. Uh, called Damnation, which should be out sometime in the mid to late spring of this year. Nice. So, you know, back to my day job. Um, <laughs> and and it, it actually has something to do with the paranormal, I guess, in a roundabout way. And the same sort of questions, because they they fascinate me, the same sort of questions about life and death and good and evil and, and who we really are and how the paranormal might relate to that. So, um, so yeah, even when I'm doing my real work, uh, I still I'm still fascinated by this this sort of journey of trying to discover who we are and what we might be dealing with beyond just the mundane zero baseline level of our daily existence. Amen. Well, hey, that's awesome, Paul. Really had a great time. Thanks again. Keep doing what you do. Hopefully we'll talk again in the future. Thanks, guys. Very, very good to talk to you. And, and um, folks listening won't know, but I actually missed the first call time and they were they were very good about because i screwed up the time zones so they're very good about calling me back i appreciate that fellas hey no problem being yeah paul it was uh, it was truly a pleasure sir it's it's refreshing believe it or not to uh, hear somebody not afraid to say i don't know and that these answers will never be answered you know so it, it was very refreshing uh, i really enjoyed talking to you man thanks for coming on no well, i appreciate having the opportunity guys um and um just remember, there's always another side to truth. I, I, that, I got to come up with a better catchphrase, but that's all. I <laughs> that one's oh, perfect. Cool. All right, man. Take it easy. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Good.